Welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about finding the why and how people buy. I'm your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for lending me your ears. And if you're watching us on YouTube on the Sales Influence channel, thank you for lending me those eyeballs. Today, I got this guy that had the nerve, like literally had the nerve to, to hit me with a, a video. And he's, and I, like, I think I kind of like this guy already. Please welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, my man, James Barkley. What's happening, James? What's popping, Victor? Thanks for having me, man. I'm a big fan. I love all your stuff. Say what sales. Uh, yeah. So, so James, uh, you know, you reached out to me. I, I was talking to John Barrell. Which, that interview was so good. I, I, I like talking to John Barrell. He's real deal. Straight down the middle, East Coast in the house type of thing. It is what it is. That's a win. No, he is exactly the same person in real life that you see online. I swear to God. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's why I like to. I go. I gotta get him on. I gotta get him on the show. And then about, I think when I was trying to get him on, I think a couple of days later, you reached out. Yep. And then I go, who, 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 who's James Buckley? Who, who the hell's James Buckley? Exactly so what you I, need to ask. That's right. And then so all of a sudden, there's this video attached. And there's this, there's, there's this big giant teddy bear trying to sell me on, on being on the Sales Influence podcast. I go, you see, that's how you do it. And you did it the right way. Thank do you, you know what I mean? You didn't yeah. come overboard. You didn't come hard. You're like, hey, Vic, what's up? Yep. Just thought I'd, you know, and then I, I, I pushed back. I said, well, what do you want to talk about? And then you sent me, this is what I want to talk about. I said, what do you think, Vic? I go, well, I think that's pretty good. That's what we're going to talk about. Yes. And so, and so, man, I appreciate you, man. Let them know who you are, James. Give a little background who you are. Yeah, yeah. So what's popping, man? Sales influence community. I am so excited to be here. My name is James Say What Sales Buckley. I work for John Barrows and my job is to help sales reps break through the noise and be more meaningful and more human in their sales process while still having great structure and process that supports their success. And I, th I think I am addicted to success. That is like my big giant macro that started in college and I really focused on it. I wrote my thesis on it. Uh, and the whole concept of how people become successful in sales or in life in general has always been really interesting to me. And I project that positive out as big and as loud as I can because I get it back tenfold every single day. Dude, man, you're like a human echo machine. Boof, success, boof, success. <laughs> so so what, before we get into our topic about branding yourself as a salesperson, especially yeah. on LinkedIn, which I think is, a, you know, that's what really hooked me. Oh, yeah. I go, okay, nobody's really talking about that. You right. know, talk about this thesis of success you're talking about, because I don't want to kind of, you know, pass that up. No, not at all. I, I wrote my thesis on the success and development of non-traditional students in college specifically. And all of my research proved that when you go to college right out of high school, you, mm -hmm. there's like no life experience that happens before that transition. If there is, it's usually fairly minimal. Right. But when you have children right out of high school and you get married when you're really young and you've lost and gained and maybe you've lost a parent and had some real life experience happen to you and then you go back to college hmm. the struggle that motivation for what you've been going through before you got educated motivates you that much more so the success rate for non-traditional students is somewhere in the 70 percent range whereas the success rate for a traditional student is like 17%. So wow. it's a vast difference. That's why every semester colleges see this giant influx of students. And by like week four or five, there's like a fraction of them left. And mm -hmm. it's so hard to find those people that are willing to go back to school and invest in themselves and right. be more than what they are now. And I try to do that every single day. And I, I tell that story. My thesis was a great thesis to write. I learned a lot in it. Dude, did you ever publish it, by the way? Did you ever publish it? It, it is published. It is published at the school. I didn't like publish it as a book, but it's definitely there. I feel like I could do that, and I probably will. Where's yeah. the time when you're in sales? You know what uh, I mean? Well, you'll make the time. You'll make the time. So I love that. So what is your background? What is your educational background? Can I yeah, ask? Yeah, so I was politely asked to leave several high schools when I was in uh, <laughs> Miami, Florida, uh, that's where I was born and raised. I went to Palmetto High School and Killian High School, and I was supposed to go to MacArthur South, but I was politely asked to just step away from education altogether. Mm -hmm. I was a problem student. I developed a drug problem really early in life, mm -hmm. uh, and it just took me down a bad path. You, if mm -hmm. you're from Miami, you already know that drugs 
down there are a thing. You can, mm. I was in the restaurant world, 15 years in the kitchen, really heavy drug use there. Uh, and then suddenly something happened to me. I didn't, I like, I realized that what I was doing was just flushing everything that I wanted for my future, like down the toilet. And I almost died. <laughs> I went to the hospital. Uh, the doctor was like, not stupid. You know, you're under these big fluorescent lights mm -hmm. and they're like, they know, you know, like your eyes are this big. <laughs> they're right. like, they're right. like, look, uh, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life, but if you don't stop living the way that you're living right now, you're going to be dead in like three months. Maybe your heart just can't sustain what you're doing. So three days later, everything I owned on a truck, I moved to East Tennessee for 14 years. Now I'm living in East Tennessee in the, at the Smoky mountains and it's probably the best thing I ever did was getting away and separating myself. So I end up going back to college. I get a degree in writing communications. I minored in sociology and I, I got a degree and I never thought that if anybody ever asked you, where's James Buckley 15 years ago, they would tell you dead or in prison. They would not tell you he built a brand in the SaaS sales space and is uh, a successful sales professional. That would not have been what came out of their mouth. <laughs> oh, dude, that, that's an amazing comeback story. Congratulations, man. I mean, that had, that's quite the journey back. And so you got this degree with a minor in sociology. I dig that, by the way. I really do. Because yeah. I, th I think, look, I like sociology. I like, I'm an Emil Durkheim fan. You know, that's, that's my guy. I think Hofstadter's okay. another guy I kind of like. And then, you know, the, and I also like psychology because that's what we're dealing with people, right? So it's all, it's all intertwined. That's right. And so how did you go from that to your first, let's say, you know, your mo first sales position, moment in sales, you know, walk me yep. through that. Yeah. So I decided in 2013 and 2014, I was going to join the Facebook world. So mm -hmm. I started a Facebook page. It was personal. All I did was share comedy, but on Facebook, one of the kids I went to college with after I graduated in 2014 mm -hmm. said, my company is looking for salespeople. Now in the past coming out of kitchens for like taking breaks, I was doing door to door B2B and door to door residential. So I worked for two companies that are very prominent. Um, and I did this all the time. I would step out of the kitchen for a year and go do sales. I always just had this gift for gab, right? I'm Irish. It's ha it happens. So, so I was doing this thing in and out of the kitchens. I would kind of go back and forth between those things before I went to college. And I had experience. So I said, I'm interested. Who do I need to talk to? And they, they connected me with a guy. His name is Zach Metters. Uh, and he was the business development director at a company called Cirrus Insight, uh, which was a Salesforce and inbox integration tool. Super simple. Work in Salesforce from your inbox. I didn't even know what Salesforce was. So I sit in the room, you know, and I basically prospected my way into the job. I came back a couple times. We played some ping pong, you know, like, like we, we built a relationship and he was like, man, I think you could just come on in. Like you can quit that kitchen job. And I was like, nice. So here I come, I move and now I'm on the phones and it was all phone all the time. They basically now pause there. Now pause there. Cause I go, you got some serious flow, but I want, there's some good stuff here. So, so you get this opportunity. You're, you kind of just persistent, right? So the guy that's says, right. like, come on, you know what? And probably your personality is just would have over, right? Cause I, I think that's a big part of, you know, it really is a big part of your brand, right? Not just your brand, anybody's brand, the ability to communicate, transmit that. Be People yourself. feel that. Absolutely. And, and so now you're moved into the sales position. You know, did you talk about the training that you had? I mean, what, what, were, you, what were you thinking? Like, okay, I got to do this now. There was no training other than sitting next to people listening to their phone calls. And I couldn't hear what was happening on the other end. It wasn't like they were on speakerphone. Right. right. And then they would hang up the phone and they would tell me, oh, well, they said this when I said that. Like, that was essentially the training. Just like every other sales organization, they put you in front of the product. They put you in front of the process. They put you in front of the technology. Then they hand you a quota and they go, good luck. And they provide almost no sales training. <laughs> and, why, why, and why weren't you scared? Why um, weren't you scared? You know, I had just overcome addiction and got a college degree. Hmm. If you think about that logical progression, at this point, I could have ran through walls. <laughs> you would not have been able to stop me if I wanted to run for yeah. governor, man. I would have done it 100% and not cared what anybody thought at that moment. I had nothing to lose. I had That's just it. gotten over everything that was difficult in my life. And I was ready to do something different, ready to be something more than what I was yesterday. Man, I love that. I love it because, you know, it's like sometimes adversity does create those character, right? Yeah. That, you know, it's adversity supposed creates to do character. That. <laughs> it's supposed to reveal it, I think, really. And, and so now you're in the sales position. And now yeah. what? What are you doing? Talk to me. Okay, you're learning from other people. They say, hey, they said this. You know, I said this. And so right. walk me through that. 
So 2015, I decide my New Year's resolution is that I'm going to use LinkedIn as often, if not more, than I'm using Facebook now. Why? Well, because I had just started at Cirrus Insight and I had just created this LinkedIn profile, right? And I, I'm suddenly I'm looking like a professional. Like here's this guy that 15 years ago probably would not have made it, right? And now I've got this professional presence. And my mom, you know, growing up, my mom, I love my mom. She used to say to me, James, the stuff you're putting out, it's not good for your brand. And I never knew what the <laughs> hell that meant. I never knew what it, I was like, why should I care? You know, <laughs> just the thought of James, James, yeah, dude, James, exactly James, how you imagine. not good for your brand. Not okay, good. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> you use the cuss word, you know? Yeah. So, so now I'm on LinkedIn and I remember the first thing I posted that went bananas. We had a joke, Zach and I in the office with our crew there, business development crew. We made this joke, like, why can't we just be like more honest with people and write a template that just says, hi, first name. We can do this dance for like eight months where I reach out every couple of days and annoy the shit out of you. Or we could put like 10 minutes on the calendar and have an actual words conversation. And then we can figure out if we should keep mm -hmm. talking. <laughs> Which one would you like to do? <laughs> so I put this template out overnight, 219,000 views and inbound, like my inbound game. I mean, this was like the beginning of me recognizing that a brand was something to be reckoned with. And I had one more experience prior to this with a, mm -hmm. a pest control company that really opened the door for brand. Uh, and I'm happy to tell that story, but maybe we could do it offline or something. It's, it's up to you, Matt. Well, in, so in this instance, this, this template caused people to start reaching out to me. Mm -hmm. So what I realized in that moment was I got I to gotta keep this going. Like, how do, I, how do I really keep this going here? I know I'm just going to like every day put some of my thoughts out there. Mm. So I started to do this. And that was like the starting point for what is now Say What Sales, which has become way more than I ever thought it would be when so I started. I I love that because, you know, the, you know, the, when you write something like that, people always ask me, James, like, hey, Victor, how do I sell? How do I become more effective at selling? And I'm like, yeah. well, first of all, why don't you try, try to figure out how people buy, which is my whole thing, right? How people right. buy, finding the why. And I said, how do they like to be sold to? And it's pretty much what your template said. Look, they don't want the, they don't want the back and forth. They don't want the BS. They don't want the fluffy stuff. They're like, they hey, let's have, a, <laughs> let's have a, can we have a real conversation? Right. And if, if it works, great. If it doesn't, let's still be friends. Yeah, right. It just didn't work. And and that's why I love that. And then from there, I think you – and I'm going to superimpose what I think happened. You tell me if I'm off-road or on-road. Sure. And that is you, you began to feel comfortable with your authentic self. You said, maybe my authentic self is okay. I think that was the first time that I felt okay with myself. Hmm. You know, up to that point, I had always, you know – you don't come from the best background. Not everybody comes from like the silver mm. spoon background or the, or the, mm. you know, the, the super amazing, I've always had everything handed to me background. Right. Uh, some people have rougher backgrounds and I came up from a little bit of a rougher background to be frank with you. And what was your background? What was your background? Give it, give me yeah, some. So my dad worked two jobs. Uh, you know, he, he was, he was pretty loose with the words. He was pretty loose with the hand. If you know what I mean? Um, my mom, my mom kind of like, you know, him and her had some issues. There was a divorce in my teenage years. I spent a lot of time between houses. Uh, you know, it, it's, it just doesn't always, some people still have the, the my, my parents have been married for 50 years and white picket fence and that's great for them. Like I, I'm, I'm happy that those people are out there and that we know that it can exist. But uh, you know, when you come from some kind of struggle and you start telling that story and you start being real about it, you become much more comfortable with yourself. I, I tell my story of my divorce, my, my, my first wife, I tell that story openly. Obviously I don't like trash her, you mm. know, but, but I tell that story because you don't, you don't hold it in. Part you don't of my it brand in. Yeah. Is, is that like real life struggle and representing what it is for me personally. Some people see my life and they say, well, that's not so bad. Those people have it worse than me. There are lots of people out there mm. like that. Right. right, right. Like I, I tell people all the time, and this is part of the say what sales brand, right? We have to ride a fence. On one side of that fence are people that want to be where you are. And you should always be reaching down to help those people get on the fence. And on the other side of the fence is a bigger fence. And that's where people live that are where you want to be. And you should always be reaching up so that they can help you get on the bigger fence. And if we ride that fence forever, we will always be valuable to a community at large. Oh, man, I dig that. I dig that. The 
you touched me with the, you know, you, you, you found that you were okay with yourself. It was the first time you kind of had this sense that, you know, you know, right. The, the new me. Yeah. The sense of me. And, and so tell me what that did, because I think a lot of salespeople, you know, obviously don't come from that direction. Maybe some do, but you know, was, was there a fear? Was there any fear in becoming your authentic self? I don't want to there's sound like Oprah fear. Winfrey right now. I don't want to sound like no. Oprah Winfrey. What's no, the no, fear there's always, in being your authentic? There's always fear. Fear is where that uncomfortable feeling, and this is what I tell people when people say things like, I'm really, I'm really garbage on the phone. I need help on the phones, or I don't write emails very well. I say to people, that uncomfortable feeling that you feel about doing it, that's where growth happens. We have to look at that as something positive, not something negative. But, but how we, do you do it, James? I'm going I'm to push you because sure. I get that, and I think that's good stuff. But but I'm still afraid, James. Help me out, man. I'm trying to get over I, I don't know. Help you have to out. identify that fear. You have to know what it is before you can overcome it. Mm -hmm. if, you don't, if you say, I'm afraid, but you don't say what you're afraid of, there's no steps there that you can take to overcome it. There's nothing to practice. So you got to mm -hmm. identify that fear. So let's talk about that. Right. That's part of building your brand and investing in yourself is turning that fear into something that what I would consider a non strength instead of a weakness. It's not a weakness. It's a non strength. It's something you haven't learned yet. And I think that's part of growth. So yeah, I think identifying the fear, definitely the first step. And that's a big thing that people say to me. The call I had just before I hopped on here with you, he was like, man, I just like, I don't know what to do, where to start. How do I create content? Where do I store this stuff? Like, what does that even look like? What's my hashtag? Oh, dude, I don't know what your hashtag is. Like, you've got to, you have to know you to be able to build these things. And you have to be able to get over that fear to continue to build. So let, let's talk about people you help. And, and then uh, let's talk about the say what sales first, the background, yep. the, the evolution of that. And then we'll jump into brands. Go ahead. Yeah. So the people I help are frontline sales reps and I help them in or, well, several, several ways. But right now, I think filling their funnel is a need. They have to know how to prospect. They have to know how to identify an ideal client and find the personas within and then structure effective messaging. We help them with driving to close, right? What is the negotiation process and how do I do something like come away from a conversation knowing that it's going to close or that I shouldn't spend too much time on it because they didn't show me enough buying signals? How do I navigate that conversation effectively? Then we talk about social selling and we help them with LinkedIn specifically. How do I leverage something like a LinkedIn sales navigator more than like 10%? What we know is that the majority of companies that are using that technology specifically really struggle with adopting the full platform. So that's a huge focus for us is showing sales reps how that platform can be valuable. And then my specialty, which is now currently live at ondemand.jbarrows.com is building your personal brand invest in yourself because that's the long game. That's the thing that's going to make you more than a sales rep. You want to be a professional, somebody that is looked at as a valued resource, because if you don't start looking at yourself as a leader in your space, how can you expect your prospects to feel that way? It, you know, it, it's funny. Like I said, th this is what prompted this conversation, because when you wrote it out, I go, I kind of knew that intuitively, but you said it out loud. Sorry, oh, you okay. said it out loud. And that is that a lot of people don't see themselves as a brand, you know, and the stuff they post online, I'm like, I wouldn't post that. You know what I mean? Because I'm like that. I'm like, I wouldn't not post that. Not good for that. your brand, James. <laughs> yeah, not good for your brand. <laughs> right. And and so let, let's talk about because, you know, you know, there's baby boomers, there's yep. Gen Xers and millennials. And oh, we, we know what the we know what the deal is, right? Right? You, the boomers are going. I don't need to do anything like that. God damn it! Right. I'll be all right. All right. Yeah. Gen Xers are going. Look, I, I can work this out. I, I don't really need it. And maybe millennials are more into it. What are you finding when you're talking to these salespeople about creating your own brand? What are you finding? So I'm finding that it it doesn't have to be structured in such a way that makes you anxious or takes up too much of your time. Here's the big fear. And I think this is the fear that all these generations share. And the big separator here is that Gen Xers are a generation that came up when technology became super popular. So you could start putting things out there on on places like AOL chat rooms and then MySpace and then YouTube. When YouTube hit the scene, everything changed, right? But the generation before, after them, the, the, gen, the millennials and the Gen Zers, they're the first 
cohort of people to come into this technological era in middle school. So the big fear that all these generations have is, I don't want this to consume my life. I'm here to tell you that it does not have to, and it's not supposed to. But the way that you manage it is what defines how much time you give to it. People see this Say What Sales brand, and they think that I spend hours creating all this content, doing all these things. If you look at my screen time, and I'm happy to show it to you, it's below three hours. It's like two hours and 17 minutes a day is mm -hmm. my screen time on my phone. And then I catch myself wanting to pick my phone up and look at it. This is not something that people have to do. They don't have to feel this way. They can turn the notifications off. They can ignore that particular app, not download it on your phone, but rather log into it on your desktop. There are a lot of ways around the addiction that everyone claims to be so afraid of, but here's what's happening. If you are reaching out to somebody and you are wanting to have a conversation that eventually you hope will yield to a six-figure closed opportunity, you better be represented somewhere that says, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I am an expert got, in that field. I got to share this with you because the, your video and your outline came at the right time because I had just finished reading uh, about two, three weeks ago, the book by The Rain Group, The Virtual Selling. Mm -hmm. Jim Blunt got his book, and then the Rain Group, and I had Dave, Dave Shaby on, the COO, uh, on about a week ago. Yeah. And he, I said, Matt, he said, the stat that jumped out at me, this relates to you, it was, he says, 82% of buyers, right, go on LinkedIn. When somebody reaches out to them, 82% of buyers go on LinkedIn to look at the profile. Yep. Talk to me about that, because that's, that's, I'm sorry, we could have a long conversation, huge. but that right there was it's like. huge. Yep. Yeah. No, it's huge. When, when you reach out to somebody, you get, we know the studies are clear. It's 16 to 20 touches to generate a meaningful conversation with a cold prospect. Mm -hmm. We know that to be true. So I'll throw mm -hmm. a couple stats out while we have this conversation. Sure. No, that no, 82%, around the fifth, sixth touch, when you're like, hi, my name is, and I'm with, and we do, and we're the leading provider of, which nobody really cares about, <laughs> right? Just so you know, if you're starting your emails that way, stop it, right? <laughs> but. Okay. But when people see that enough times and it starts to get frustrating for them or it's very self-serving and it's not about them at all and they can clearly see that it's an automated cadence of some kind, that gets frustrating. So they go, who is this clown? And they immediately jump to LinkedIn. If when they get there, what they see is a lot of self-serving posts, check out my company's stuff, look at this article my company wrote, join me for this company event, uh, if you feel this way, raise your hand so I can put you in this cadence, right? There's a lot of like processes that are really well known to our prospects and they know when they see that stuff, this person just wants my money. That's the deduction that they make in their brain. This is not a human being anymore. This is someone that wants my money. And I don't want to engage with that because everybody likes to buy stuff, but nobody likes to be sold stuff. <laughs> right. So it's funny because because we get the emails. You know, I've talked about this in pad, past podcasts with others, is that we all get those emails every day. Like, yep. glad to connect. Uh, how can I be of service to you? How can I help you? My favorite is I like to get on the phone for 10 minutes so I can learn more about your business. Why don't you just read my profile? I got all it's kinds right of content. Yeah. <laughs> all. I get that like, one too. <laughs> and, and, and so you get this, and it's it's lazy selling. It's lazy selling. But getting back to the brand piece, I, I want to make this, I, I want people listening to this to walk away going, I need to up my LinkedIn game. Because yeah. that data point, that 82% look at your profile, what should be in the profile? So let's say somebody reaches out to me. I'm a big, large SaaS company, big enterprise company. Right. And I go look at the salesperson's profile. Yep. James, what should I see there? Give me your top three to five things I should be seeing sure. there. Yeah. So my friend Morgan J. Ingram, if you're not following Morgan, he works with yeah. John and myself as well. He's Muffin, fantastic. Muff, was it Muffin Mondays? Yo, Muffins with Morgan is lit, <laughs> dude. I don't care who you are. If you don't log in on Saturday, check out muffinswithmorgan.com. Yo, that whole Q&A right there is on fire right now. It's so fun. But Morgan will tell you that there are some key things to look yeah. at for a strong profile, to create a strong profile. First of all, the headline, that thing that goes underneath your profile picture, if it says salesperson of any kind, SDR, account executive, account manager, anything that says, I want to sell you something, people see that and they don't, they typically don't scroll any further. <clears throat> what should you, I put? If, if, I am, if, I'm, if I am an SDR, if I am a salesperson, what should I have there? Yeah. So look at mine, right? Mine says, I help frontline reps, frontline sales reps break through the noise. 
-hmm. That right there is what I do. My job is to connect with a frontline rep, listen to what it is that they're struggling with, because that's the point of the conversation is to help Mm -hmm. them. Right. Mm -hmm. And and then I help them. I give them advice. I tell them some steps they can take. This is the basis of my day to day routine every single day. So that's what should be in the headline. What it is that you do this way. It doesn't say I want to sell you something. The moment they see that they're running the other way. It's the same reason we run away from car salesmen and car lots. We get there really excited to look at the car and the salesperson approaches us and we're like, oh, shit, and I'm out. (laughs) <laughs> so, so, so suppose, so suppose to a title, uh, a title, it should be a benefit statement of some sort would be one some of your recommendations. They should be able to read that and tell the value that you can give them. The other thing Love to it. look at is the about page. What does it say about you in there? Are you the type of person? And I do this when I'm prospecting. And again, I guess this is probably a prospecting tip for people that sell, right? Got to leave a mm-hmm. couple of those throughout <laughs> your show here, but read people's about page, man. What kind of person is this? Do they talk in data points? If they do, you need to talk to them in data points because that's how they speak. That's their love language. Mm -hmm. But if they're the type of person whose about page is full of words like inspirational and motivational and encouraging, that's how they talk. That's what they respond to. So you need to use (laughs) words like that, right? Uh, You did a video. I watched it about mimicking in the restaurant world what your order is and the percentage of tips going up. It's the same thing. You're doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. You need the response rates to go up. That's your tip. The response rate. So the Mm -hmm. about page, write your about page and tell people who you are, what you do and how you like to be spoken to. You talked about your personality type in there. I literally put mine up there. This is the type of personality I am. (laughs) Just so you know what you're about to get into when you reach out to me. (laughs) Right. And by the way, I think you're like, you do videos and you're comfortable in front of a camera and and a lot of people aren't. And I I always tell people, I get that. I get that. I think you need to overcome your fear of getting on the camera because I don't think it's as bad as you think it is. But how about... From a content standpoint, what is video articles? Talk to me about what type of content I should be putting up there to position myself. Yeah, so I think that the thing that most reps do, and I get this question a lot, what type of content should I create is probably the number one question. And I always tell people, no one can know that but you, but here's some things to consider. If you're the person that's out there talking about your product or your service over and over and over again, that type of self-serving content doesn't get a lot of attention. There's no engagement there. And again, likes, views, none of that matters. Engagement, thoughtful comments from titles that you want to talk to. That is the point of building that brand. Get the exposure to your your target audience. So that's the type of content you should be creating. One of the things I tell reps, document your journey. Tell people what happened. That's how Say What Sales started. Hey, guys, I made this call today, and this guy told me, is this a cold call? And I said yes, and then he hung up. So I reached out to him on LinkedIn right after, and I said in my connection request, hey, it seems like cold calling is not your thing. I get that. Maybe we should put something on the calendar instead. Looking forward to it, James, cell phone number. That afternoon, he responded to me with the connection request and said, yes, that works better for me. I'm free Wednesday at 4. And we scheduled a call. He didn't buy anything because not every call equals a sale, but we were able to schedule that call and learn that because I didn't let his stop calling me attitude stop me from reaching out on a channel that worked for him. So I share that out there to my network. And suddenly the sales community is like, holy shit, I've never thought of it that way. (laughs) <laughs> Something so uh, I just had Kevin Dorsey KD on the uh, on the sales yeah, podcast. Legit, man. Yeah, he is. And so we were talking about the the authentic self, which you yeah. clearly are, <laughs> which you <laughs> clearly are. Thank you. The authentic the authentic self, and you know we're talking about how people that it takes a certain amount of courage to to put yourself out there because you know KD's posts are very revealing. Some would also say like self-deprecating. Like uh, he's like, really not- good. He is really good at showing his emotional bone as a leader. Mm-hmm. Good way of putting it. Yeah, I don't know if he would describe it that way, but it's a good way of putting it. That's how I've always described him when I tell people to follow him is I say the emotional side of leadership is important because people have to grow personally if they expect to grow professionally. And that's what I say to people. What Kevin does really well, what KD does, is he puts that emotional helmet on where everybody can see it. And I think it helps everybody to grow both personally and professionally. And most of the time, when you're looking at content, there's one or the other. It's very rare you find somebody that knows how to mesh those two together really well. And I think KD does that well. Shout out to you, KD. Mad love. No, he does it exceptionally well. The 
So the say what sales, where did that phrase come from? Yo, you were in the 80s, bro. Say what was like yeah. the thing back in the day. When it hit the scene, people started saying it left and right. And I was no exception. I said it a lot. Um, Nickelodeon had some stuff on there that I thought was was good. There was some say what stuff there. Uh, and then also the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air would use it pretty regularly throughout the show. Say what? Um, and when I started at Cirrus Insight, one of the things they realized very quickly was that my personality is gigantic. So what do you do with somebody that has a giant personality like this? You put them in front of people. So Zach Metters and I traveled the world essentially for like two years at all of these Salesforce events all over the globe, 84 of them to be exact. I kept all of the lanyards. I have like a whole collection of lanyards, but I'd stand at these booths and I would just talk to people that came up to the booth or I would leave the booth, God forbid, and I would go find people to bring back to the booth to talk to them. <laughs> like that, that became my go-to. So I remember one, uh, one, you know, one of the times I went there to, I think it was Dreamforce, right? When I really, when I really hit the stride and say what sales was on the rise, I went to this Dreamforce. I've been to like six Dreamforces, uh, and people were yelling out, say what sales at me from the booths, other SDRs and, uh, and salespeople that were followers of mine were like screaming. We're the same person. That's my tagline. If you're a salesperson, we're the same person. I say that in every single piece of content I put out. So they just yelling this at me. And that's when I, it was like, man, that is a huge brand win. Look at what's happening. People, we do a video with me. Hey, can we do a quick video on Instagram? Like it, it really, it, it went to this point that I never thought it would go to. And that's when I doubled down and just started really investing in the content piece and putting my thoughts out there. And that's the part that almost every sales rep that's out there on LinkedIn forgets about. Your own original thought is valuable. But if you don't see it as valuable, nobody else will either. Period, the end. That's not even a conversation. And, and, and that's where the courage piece comes in. But be, because that not a lot of people have that, James. Yeah. So here I am, a salesperson. I, I I'm like I, I I'm not James. Look at this guy. He's like a like a you know like a jogger, not you know coming up. <laughs> you know, like he says, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. What can I do, James? What can yeah. I do? If I'm yeah. think. By the way, so let me frame you here. I'm an introvert trying to become an ambivert. Come on, pull me out of my shell, man. How do I begin to do something to create my own brand? Help me out here. Help a yes, not, out. So not So not everybody has to be, and I tell people this all the time, you don't have to be this big, huge personality to build a valuable brand. Mm -hmm. Branding yourself <laughs> has to do with delivering value consistently on multiple platforms to reach a very specific and or a very large audience. So look at it this way, right? Um, everybody has personality types. And I say this often that we gravitate towards people mm -hmm. that we, we meet somebody for the first time. We have no idea why, but we're like, that person is awesome. Mm -hmm. Conversely, we have the opposite <laughs> people that we meet and we go, I hate that prick. If I ever see them again, it's going to be too soon. I never want to see them in my life. I don't even know why they're no real. Yeah. That's just real. That's, that's people. That's human. Uh, yeah. Because that's true, and we know that innately, <clears throat> we can leverage the people that gravitate towards our personality by representing it authentically online. See that's see that that's it. This is what I'm talking about. You're you're you're, you're getting finally to well, I call it now we're getting bone to the bone here. We're getting to the bone here because <laughs> I think people have to accept the fact that not everybody's going to like you. Now we all say that, but that's we right. still try to play the popularity contest. Yep. You know, you look you look at you, you, John Barrels. An acquired taste. I'm sorry, but an acquired <laughs> taste, right? Be, and, and you like it? Like, I love him. I'm like, yeah, I like that. That's the way I like it, right down the middle. <clears throat> you look at a Jeffrey Gittimer, poof, like a KD. His is not hard. He's just very, here are my flaws. I'm just trying, and I'm just hustling, right? Yeah. James Buckley comes along and says, hey, I love the world. Will the world love me? I hope most of you do. But if you don't, that's cool, too. I want that, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I think people need to let that. It's hard, though, James. It's hard to let – I don't have a problem with it. You don't have a problem with it. But I think it's hard for a lot of people to let their authentic self leak out a little bit onto social media. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? 
I think what they're, I think what the fear is there, I've identified that fear on many cases. Mm -hmm. It's judgment. It's judgment from people they know, judgment from strangers. They are afraid in most cases. This is not everybody. Some people have very legitimate reasons for not being online. I have an ex-wife too. It's the worst story you'll ever hear. I'm happy to tell it to anybody that wants to hear it. But I feared getting online for fear that she would come back and try to ruin me once again. Right. Mm. That is a very real fear. If we are not willing to face that fear, we are limited in our personal and professional growth forever. And the reason is because online is how people are connected all over the world today. Maybe what you're putting out is not directly valuable for your friend of 15 years that you've known since you were seven. Mm -hmm. But some stranger in Abu Dhabi sees mm -hmm. that video and it changes their life forever because the perspective makes them a better them. If I had to choose between some friend of mine for 15 years that is judgmental of everything I'm trying to do to grow professionally and personally, and somebody I don't know coming to me saying, you have changed my life, I'm going with the latter. Mm -hmm. And I'm it's telling that person, thank you. I appreciate you. Have a great day. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I think people can do that. And, and again, I, I, I want to emphasize because a lot of people say, well, I don't have that, whatever that is, that type of personality. Yep. Nobody's asking you to have any type of personality but your own. And that is if you're a type A, right, by the numbers type of person, I think you said earlier, said I just wrote it, Doug, that's funny. He goes, if that's your love language, in the words <laughs> of James Buckley, if, if your love language is data, then your postings, you know, or your information could be about that. And you will attract that type of individual or individuals right. to your channel. So it's just using your personality. I just wanted to kind of hear you just talk about that because it's like immediately I know the pushback's going to be, I, I'm not him. I don't have a personality. Dude, you could be like type A, zero personality of a rock. And that's you right. You have an something. ideal buyer if that's you. Mm -hmm. I have an you, ideal buyer for somebody that loves my energy. Mm -hmm. can't tell you how many people send me messages. James, your energy is infectious. Mm -hmm. Those are my buyers, man. <clears throat> if yeah. I... If I then have somebody that's like, yo, I had a great time talking, but it's a little much for me. I'm like, yo, you know, you should, should connect with somebody that's more like you. Like, let me introduce you to my friend, right? Somebody that probably you will gravitate towards because they're a little more low key. That's a solid move for a, a business to get in the habit of. But we don't right. want to work together. We want all the we want all the sales for ourselves, right? Right, right, the, right. That person is unlikely to buy from you, but they they might be more likely to buy from you know Amy or, or Josh, right? Like that person Somebody might else. have a person. That, yeah, anybody else. Change the face. Change the face. So if if I wanted to build a brand, so let me just walk through it now. I've I've, I've taken some of your suggestions, and by the way, yep. where I know you have a course on this. Where do, where I do. can I find the course on this? So you can find the course at ondemand.jbarrows.com, and it's not just my course for the four hundred and twenty dollars just putting the price out there so everybody knows what to expect. The $420, you get filling the funnel. That's a certification course. Uh, you get driving to close. That's the closing course. You get Morgan's social selling. If you ever want to learn how to do social selling in a different way that is effective. And then you get the personal branding course, plus all the sales tips, webinars, and all that fun stuff that we do on the side. All of that for $420 on demand dot jbarrows.com. This is brand new. We're going straight to the sales reps with this because mm -hmm. we feel that that's the person that needs this the most. Right, so right. it's important that they invest in themselves and learn how to do these things simultaneously so that they can reach for that other fence. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, uh, by the way, I love that analogy. Up here, pull up here, pull down there, something like that. But yeah. that whole thing about aiming it at sales reps, Again, it's a paradigm shift. You're telling sales, direct salespeople to be brands at the same time. Yep. And But the thing is, one of the things, I, and I'm sure you mentioned it, is that that brand is portable. That means it's yours. It's not the company's. It's really yours. And if you yep. go to another company, your brand goes with you. Talk That's about right. that as a motivator. Absolutely. Listen, we cannot tie the content to our product or company or service. We have to tie it to us because before your product and your service and your company are valuable to your prospects, you are the value. That's what you represent, the initial contact, the first impression. So this is a pushback that a lot of people get from their company. Hey, we're fine with you doing what you want with your social media profiles, but we can't. you can't talk about the company. We'd rather you not put content out. That's no problem. Sure. 
Tell stories about people that you've helped. Tell stories about problems that you've solved. Take analogies that I gave you examples of earlier and put them into context in your value, in your industry, in your vertical. Relate it back to things that your target audience cares about. And you're going to find that they engage just fine. And that right there is organic. You don't have to work with marketing to get those leads. They mm -hmm. come naturally. And isn't, isn't that the point of all of this is to have new conversations with people you've never spoken to so that they get interested in learning. What do you do? I love that question. Hey, what do you do? I'm not going to tell you voluntarily. You're going to have to ask because mm -hmm. I'm going to earn the right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I, I love the fact that you, you gave us a little roadmap there, right? And I'm going to still suggest people go to the course because I saw some of the outlines on your website and I'm, it, it looks like great content for the price. Thank you. Big point, invest in yourself. Stop waiting for a company to invest in you. So let's, let's check. Because it's your investment, it really is your investment. You can take it with you anywhere. And it's point a career thing. It's a career thing, right? No matter what job. And I like the, the small tips about writing the way you want to write without mentioning the company involving marketing. And these are things that anybody can do. Just have to figure out how to you know, do them consistently. I'm sure that's part of the process. And so what has been the takeaway in terms of let's talk money, James. Stock money, man. What has been the impact of people who've done it the right way? What have you seen? Yeah, so let's talk about two groups that do this well. Uh, we can talk about grown professionals out there like Oprah Winfrey that built a professional personal brand. We can talk about the Steve Harveys of the world that all started with just comedy, right? If you thought Steve Harvey aimed when he began comedy to host the, the family feud, I can assure you that that never crossed his mind. And yet there he is. We could talk about uh, the actors that have also built strong professional brands. We can look at The Rock, who just crossed the 200 million follower mark on Instagram. Now let's talk about the kids, the future. Look at Ryan's Toys Reviews on YouTube, 127 million followers. Okay, but I, I want you to tie. I want you to tie. See, I'm thinking right now, I'm listening to this podcast. I go, James, yeah. these people are out of my sphere of influence. Yeah, but they Bring all it. started the same place you're going to start. James, I can't relate to them. Give me somebody I can relate to, James. I'm in direct yeah. sales. Give me something. Yeah, sure. So look at Beck Holland. There's somebody you can relate to. Beck Holland, Beck Holland uh, formerly of Chorus, Gong, and G2 crowd is now branched off and her anti-brand personal brand, which I think is interesting, has become flip the script, which I think is going to change everything, right? Because so walk, walk us through that. Wait a minute. You're assuming we know something. We don't know anything about this person. So walk yeah. us through that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Beck and I originally met in Georgia at an event and I was there representing uncrushed.org, which is a mental health organization that focuses on being strong in the ment in the mentality world in business, right? Mental health and business. We all deal with stuff. It's crazy. We talk about this openly, but Beck at that point was still a sales leader. She was managing a team. She was an individual contributor at the same time, kind of a, a leader coach uh, contributor. And she, she never really wanted to like build a brand, but she had this great way of speaking about sales and developing your messaging and you know delivering a great message to your prospect that resonates with them. Fast forward, she starts doing her own thing. She starts going out doing flip the script events, right? First event of 2020 before March where everything kind of fell off the map, she had flip the script tour, which was her and Scott Barker uh, and uh, Josh Braun. And they all went around and did this free event in a bus and it was the, it turned out after it ended, March happened. It was the only event of 2020 in our space. Hmm. It was the only one. And it was her event and everyone gravitated towards her. She ended up building like, you know, 20 or 30 more thousand followers. And just this year, she decided to branch off and do her own thing because that's the progression that you get when you invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. That, I, we'll, say, we'll, say, we'll say that that is the option you get. When you invest in yourself. So if, if one day you decide to do your own thing, you yeah. can do your own thing. I love that. That's right. And, and nobody takes a job thinking, oh, man, this is perfect. It's what I want to do with the rest of my life. Absolutely. No question. When I die, I want to be exactly doing the job that I'm doing right now today. No one thinks that way. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks 
What's next? What's more? We get complacent. That's human nature. Morgan J. Ingram had exactly the same experience when he started the SDR Chronicles. It's This is his way of investing in himself. I'm going to do this show. I'm going to put it on YouTube. I'm going to put myself out there. It was a nightmare at first, but it got better over time. And mm -hmm. now he's one of the most prominent sales leaders in our space. Correct. Yeah. In other words, he, for those of you, he does have something called the SDR Chronicles, where he talks about sales development reps, you know, issues, trials and tribulations and all that. It's a very casual conversation, right? It's just him yeah. and a microphone, a little camera. And I, I remember watching the views on that going, it's just plain talk. Yep. And, you know, with questions and answers, but it's just, it's just plain talk. And I think people underestimate the value, which is this brings it full circle back to what you were saying, is that some people just want authentic conversation. Hey, maybe this isn't the channel to communicate. Maybe this is a better channel. Is that it? Hey, we can go around Robin for eight weeks going back and forth, or we could just have a conversation in 10 minutes. I mean, that's what they want. They want just the conversation. When you think about the brain chemistry of what the average salesperson's day looks like, it spends 90% <laughs> of the time. By the way, I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> well, there's, again, sorry. I, there's like two modes here that I think we flip flop in. One is the tactical mode. And we spend like 90% of our time in this tactical mode. What do I say? How do I say it? What's the best message? How do I structure it? Where do I send it? Who does it go to? What am I mentioning? What am I sending them for collateral? This tactical approach. If you are the person that reaches out and switches them over to this fresh air cerebral approach, something that gets them to say, I never thought of it that way. That is a new pattern interrupt for them that gets their attention much more often. And I think it's a little more meaningful because when we think tactical, we think outcome. And when somebody approaches us that has a very clear and specific expected outcome, that can be a lot of pressure, even at the subconscious level for our prospects, which is why we struggle sometimes to figure out what we're going to say to somebody when we reach out. This is why huge amounts of emails in our sales space start with following up, touching base, checking in, bubbling this up to the top and all the other crappy things that we tend to say that really translate into, I have no real reason for talking to you, right? <laughs> like That's why those things exist is because we're so concerned with the outcome, we've lost sight of the person. Uh, if you time, you said something, and we'll begin to wrap this up, but I, I kind of want to, I think I want to land here because I want to tie it to brand and sales because you said so many great things. This is one of those deals that you listen to on the repeat. You don't go, <laughs> oh, I missed that one, right? The, you know, in, in a world of product parity or service parity where all the products are almost the same, right? I believe, and I just want you to add your flavor to the statement, that the salesperson has become the new differentiator because all the products are the same. All the services are almost the same. Even if there is a small change, it's not that big of a difference. And so the customers, the buyers are looking for a salesperson. And once they go online and they search for you, 82% of the time on LinkedIn, buyers will search for you and look for your personality. It is that brand that will begin the branding of the differentiator. Close me out with that. Yeah, that... Again, before your product, service, whatever you're selling is valuable, you are the reason why somebody engages. So if the, if the rep on the other end at your competitor is the type of rep that doesn't have original thoughts, is not considered somebody that is you know, leading the thoughts in that space. I hate the buzzword thought leader and, and influencer, even though I feel like they're valid, it, it, they've lost a lot of their potency because of what's built up around them. That's a whole different conversation. When you are the person that is consistently delivering thoughtful content that helps somebody else grow and they go find you there, that is the person that gets your attention first. It's not the person that is clearly self-serving, sharing things that their marketing team is likely sending them going, hey, will you share this? Hey, will you share this? Hey, will you share this? Right? That is so meaningless in the grand scheme. But if I if I see you and you're different and you're unique and I'm looking at your messaging too and it's personalized and it's meaningful for me and you've sent me a video, right? That is clearly for me and not for anyone else. You took the time. If that's your brand, you stand so much more likelihood of getting the engagement that every sales professional under the sun needs before anything else can happen. Yeah. And what, what I loved about your video, to, to really put a fine point on how we got together, it was very casual. 
it, it wasn't like you prepared. Like you didn't go into a room with a green screen. Do you know, it's just you. I don't know if you're like in a basement or something, but it's your, My whatever basement. your yeah. was a basement. <laughs> and I'm like, this guy's calling me for his basement. He's sending me a video from his basement. But it, but again, it wasn't so much the character as it was the content. You know, it wasn't the context of your environment. It was really what he was, what you were saying to me. Yeah. And, and and I was like, oh, here's a perfect example of somebody who doesn't overthink the process, but his personality is just transmitted, you know, through that. And again, you don't have to have a James Buckley personality. You nope. could be straight lace, talk directly, because some people just want to write down the middle, and you would have that impact. So, James Buckley, man, you have the last word before I sign out. What do you want to say to these folks before I leave? This is going to sound crazy, Victor, but I have to do this. I do it on every podcast. Uh, if you want to talk to me, please text me or call me. My cell is 305-632-6005. I love cold calls. So call me. Just expect that I'm not going to buy from you. I'm going to critique your pitch. So just know that that's what's in store for you. You can reach me at james at jbarrows.com. You can also check out our on-demand sales training for your frontline rep and at ondemand.jbarrows.com. And man, let's talk. Let's connect. Let's have a real words conversation. I've never met a stranger in my life, and I appreciate this so much, man. Thank you for having me. You're welcome, man. I want to encourage you to follow him on LinkedIn. I'm telling you, the content's beautiful. And then once you put the, if you're listening to this, you have to go to LinkedIn. You'll see the personality and you'll understand that much more. And on that note, that is it for the Sales Influence Podcast. Leave me some feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, wherever you'll find me. And if you get a chance, check out the Sales Velocity Academy at salesvelocityacademy.com to help you sell more effectively that much faster. And that is it for the Sales Influence Podcast. James Buckley, Victor Antonio, signing off, reminding you that selling ain't hard when you got a great LinkedIn profile and you know how to do it. Take care.